those of us who have had the high privilege of serving closely with President Kennedy will always cherish the gallantry and the wisdom and the grace with which he carried his awesome and lonely responsibilities. This is a great nation with great strength and much unfinished business. And one of our greatest Americans is now present. President Johnson needs and deserves our fullest support as he takes up these high responsibilities on behalf of all of us Americans. We are about to wind this up for tonight because about all that could happen on one day has. For some final reflection on one of the more horrible days in American history, you find there is a great deal that could be said about the political and other changes we can look forward to now, but I think it would be bad taste to go into that now, and I won't. It has all been shocking, but perhaps one element in the shock was the speed. By the Washington clock, at a little after one o'clock this afternoon, President Kennedy was about as li alive as any human being ever gets, young, strong, vigorous, looking forward to, no doubt, five more years, he hoped, of leadership in this country and of the Western world. His wife, young, beautiful, looking very happy, was beside him and seeming to be having a wonderful time and leaning across the back seat of the car to say to him, you can't say Dallas hasn't been friendly to you. And that was a little after one o'clock. Five hours later, at six o'clock, Mr. Kennedy had been murdered. Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. Mrs. Kennedy was a widow, a brave and composed one that nobody could fail to admire. All of them were back in Washington, returning in the same airplane that took them to Texas to an incredible tragedy. And the sheer speed of it was just too fast for the senses. Roosevelt, dead of a stroke, came back here from Warm Springs, Georgia, in a train, the sides of it draped in black crepe. It steamed majestically across the southern landscape toward Washington, taking a little time about it and giving everybody a time to think a bit about what had happened. But not today. There is seldom any time to think anymore, and today there was none. In about four hours, we had gone from President Kennedy in Dallas alive to back in Washington dead and a new president in his place. There is no more news here tonight and really no more to say except that what has happened today has been just too much, too ugly, and too fast. Frank? Thank you, Dave. The Dallas police chief, Jesse Curry, announced just a few moments ago that charges of murdering President Kennedy have been filed against Lee Harvey Oswald, a 24-year-old former Marine with a history of connection with left-wing causes. Now we would like to go to WBAP-TV and Robert McNeil with some reports on the late developments in connection with Oswald and some of the preparations that had been made at the branch of Vice President Lyndon Johnson for what was expected to be a weekend of campaigning and relaxation. Let's go to WBAP-TV and NBC's Robert McNeil. The president's death has left one group of people at least and especially in stunned confusion. A story from Charles Murphy. No city was more saddened by today's events than Austin, the state's capital and the home of the wounded governor. Austin City Auditorium was to have been the setting tonight for a gala $100 a plate political banquet. Hundreds of persons who would have uh, attended the dinner had already arrived in the city. Preparations for the thousands of guests stopped suddenly when the tragic news was heard. The dinner was to have been the final public ceremony for Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy on their Texas trip. The 24-year-old prisoner who has been under questioning by Dallas police for over eight hours has just been formally charged with the murder of President Kennedy. But the prisoner, Lee Oswald, has not admitted to shooting himself, and Dallas Police Chief Jess Curry describes him as a stoic individual who admits nothing. He believes he's being held because he once lived in Russia. Oswald, who said two years ago he wanted Russian citizenship, was fined $10 recently in New Orleans for distributing communist literature. He's married to a Russian woman who was brought to the police station with their small daughter his, and his mother, who lives in a Dallas suburb. She was also questioned and said, I am heartbroken about this, 
he is really a good boy. Oswald's only comment to the world at large since his arrest has been a denial. Oh. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. Do you have a lawyer? No, sir, I don't. I've just been... Look back, you want to go through? Police Sergeant Gerald Hill describes Oswald's capture. Suspect sitting on the third row from the back of the theater. The suspect jumped up, yelled, This is it, and took a swing at the officer. Officer McDonald started to grapple with the man as he reached for a gun which was concealed under his shirt, and uh, the gun was fired one time by the suspect, but luckily it misfired. The pin hit the shell, but it did not fire. McDonald yelled for help. The other officer in the theater and I managed to subdue the man, disarm him, and handcuff him. At that time, we brought him out of the building, put him in a squad car, and brought him straight to homicide and robbery, and turned him over to Captain Fritz. Who are those officers? So although, although he has not yet admitted the shooting, the suspect, Lee Oswald, has been formally charged with murdering President Kennedy. Circumstantial evidence puts him in the room from which the shots were fired. Lab tests are being conducted to prove that he fired the murder rifle. Robert McNeil, NBC News, reporting. Violent death is no stranger to the family of Joseph P. Kennedy. Along with great wealth and political triumph, many tragedies have come to this Irish-American clan from Boston. Joseph P. Kennedy, Jr., the elder brother of the assassinated president, was lost in action in World War II. A Navy pilot, Kennedy vanished on an air mission from England to occupied Europe in 1944. Now, this was the son who was originally... Uh, had originally borne the political hopes of the family, but he did not live to enter that field. Only one month later, a son-in-law, the Marquis of Hartington, was killed in action in France. And then in 1948, Lady Hartington, the former Kathleen Kennedy, perished with three others in a plane crash in France. For many years, another sister, Rosemary, has been in an institution for the mentally retarded. It was this misfortune that spurred the family's interest in programs for the prevention and treatment of mental retardation. A family foundation named for Joseph P. Kennedy, Jr. has contributed large sums to this cause, and only last month, President Kennedy signed bills providing millions in federal funds to help combat this affliction. The head of the Klan, Joseph P. Kennedy, Sr., suffered a stroke in December of 1961 and never has recovered normal speech or the ability to walk. And for the First Lady, the former Jacqueline Bouvier, now Mrs. Kennedy, today's tragedy ended a 10-year marriage marked by many moments of intense personal loss. Twice, miscarriages robbed her of babies, and last August, the son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, died two days after his premature birth, and today, the loss of her husband. And I am sure that the thoughts and sympathies of all of us are with the First Lady tonight. There is no way of calculating the millions of words that have been uttered in the course of this day in all countries of the world as human beings fumble for words to express their offended senses at what has happened in the United States. I seriously doubt that any words uttered by anyone anywhere have uh, succeeded in expressing what you feel yourself. I would suppose that the answer for that is... Uh, <clears throat> ...only to be found in the hearts of people. This concludes NBC's coverage for today. We will resume our coverage tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock with the NBC Today Show. They will continue until 10. At that time, the NBC News team that has manned this desk today will return, and we will continue our coverage until 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. At that time, NBC's local affiliates will continue with their coverage of the events as they continue to unfold. At 5 o'clock, NBC will return to the air tomorrow afternoon and bring you coverage throughout the evening. This is Frank McGee, NBC News, speaking for Bill Ryan, Chet Huntley, David Brinkley, Herb Kaplow, Peter Hackus, Robert McNeil, and literally hundreds of other technicians and newsmen who have worked throughout the day to bring you this sad story. November the 22nd, into the history book, stamped forever with the blackness of this day indeed. Thank you. Good night.